Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from what part of the world that you're joining in from. We are super excited today. Um, we'll give just another minute to make sure that um, everyone can tune in today. And in the meanwhile, something that I wanted to share that uh, about Dime Webinar, this is one of the most favorite thing of mine that we host every month. And every month, Dime tries to bring towards experts and bring them on the webinar series so that we can share with the world on um, what are the advances and everything is happening. And today is special because today for the first time we have all speakers and moderators as pharmacists on the table. <laughs> uh, so it's it's, it, it just makes me feel happy and uh, grateful that, you know, we are involving and Dime takes real pride in terms of intentionally involving pharmacists and voices of pharmacists into multiple initiatives that we have, starting from IMPACT, which was the Virtual First Medical Practice Collaboration, where uh, we have great partners uh, from Aston Rx Health to also Playbook uh, Driving Adoption, which is our industry guide for digital clinical measures where we involve a voice from American Pharmacists Association. So um, super excited. Before we kick us off, we will run through just a few housekeeping. Please note that the session is recorded today and it should be available to everyone in next 24 to 48 hours. And the beauty about these live webinars are that you can ask questions and more the merrier questions. So you can do that by two ways, either type in the chat box below or raise a little hand that would be uh, in the control settings below. And we would encourage you to be an engaging participant. And without further ado, I am super excited and delighted to have two stellar experts and pharmacists um, today discussing about digital medicine and the future of pharmacists. Mel, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> My name is Mel Oderzinski. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Aspen RX Health. Um, as Smith mentioned, I am a pharmacist by trade and I've been involved in a lot of different components of pharmacy over the year, late years. Um, and just super excited, you know, as pharmacists are really engaging in, in this movement in virtual medicine. Awesome, thrilled to have you, Mel. Um, and Gerald. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. First, again, very pleased to be here, and especially sitting next to Mel, right? Who's like, hi, Mel. No, I'm just, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just wonderful. <clears throat> so I'm Gerald Fink, and I'm a pharmacist, uh, very proud to be a pharmacist, and I'm uh, currently the CEO of RxC2. And um, the, the spiel is, right, you can give your mission statement, RxC2 is... Uh, is um, incorporating the practice of pharmacy into clinical research, right, to make clinical trials just another healthcare option for everyone everywhere. But I want to take a second, really, for all of us to really think about that, right? When we talk about the practice of pharmacy in clinical research, I'm talking about the practice of pharmacy, not just a, you know, dispensing piece, not just a counseling piece. I'm talking about the organizational, the whole aspect of the practice of pharmacy in the clinical research. And I've done that because I've been in the industry 40 years and I know the practice of pharmacy doesn't exist in clinical research today. There are pharmacists in research, but there's not the practice of pharmacy. There's no chief pharmacy officer in most pharma companies. And I think that needs to change. And when I say everyone everywhere, we talk about diversity and rural, et cetera. I mean, everyone everywhere in all parts of the world. And the practice of pharmacy exists in all parts of the world. And so our mission statement is very, you know, you can rattle it off, but I think all of us, and, and we do that time to time, we should all step back because the mission statement is like Aspen Rx, great mission statement, dying, great mission statement. You know, we need to live this. And we'll talk about that further, I think, as we get into this. So thank you very much. And sorry for the lecture, but um, I think it's important, you know, with where the discussions we're going to have today. Absolutely. And uh, delighted to have you, Gerald. And I think you touch upon a really important point that pharmacists, uh, being on the table from the research, from not just from the care setting. And it is so critical. And uh, the work that you do, and uh, I'm stoked to dive deeper into it. Mel, would you like to, something that recently um, COVID pandemic has uh, shown a bright light on pharmacists and the work that um, pharmacists do, not just in educating, but being that front digital 
coaches for any information, for any questions related to healthcare. And that has led to some of the work at Aspen Rx from the virtual first side. Would you like to give us a um, quick uh, roundup on some of the work that Aspen Rx has been doing? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so at Aspen Rx Health, <clears throat> just to kind of give a bit of background on what we do, we have built, you know, really a first of its kind mobile technology that connects a nationwide pharmacist network to health plan members. So via an innovative matching algorithm that's based on, you know, often overlooked social and clinical determinants, including language, geography, areas of clinical specialization, this level of intricate matching improves the member experience clinical outcomes and sets the foundation for longitudinal, longitudinal provider patient relationships. So you know, if you think about the example of uh, being, being able to connect patients with pharmacists um, based on some of these criteria, um, you know, we could have a Manhattan-based pharmacist that speaks Mandarin and is accredited in HIV management is actually who is connected with a Manhattan-based Medicare or Medicaid beneficiary that speaks Mandarin and, and is managing a complex HIV medication regimen. So really trying to match um, pharmacists to patients um, to provide uh, that improved experience and clinical outcomes. And so our business model really, you know, it, it I think it's easiest to explain it as an analogy. Um, you can think of Uber. Uh, so except, except instead of the drivers, um, those are our pharmacists, and then the riders are really the patients. So we're really the, the first pharmac clinical pharmacist um, gig, you know, marketplace for pharmacists. And so, you know, as, as, as you've asked about sort of the, the pandemic and, and as we look at what we've been doing around, um, you know, sort of advancing within virtual care, um, you know, one trend that we continue to see in, in the <clears throat> industry of pharmacy is really shifting that role of pharmacists from just traditional dispensing functions to really providing clinical services, which, you know, is really how I think we can truly add value. And so Aspen Rx utilizes really an innovative virtual first care model that reimagines the value of the pharmacist patient relationship using a personalized digital medicine approach. So, you know, we've developed that tech that empowers pharmacists and really allows them to focus on what's most important, which is patient care. I love that. I'm going to reference Aspen Rx as the Uber of pharmacy um, and delivering care um, that is involving so many critical components around the language differences, around the social determinants of health, and around like how uh, a person living in Manhattan speaking man Mandarin, how they can actually manage their HIV medication traditionally, which has been so difficult. Um, Gerald, I want to ask you, from your perspective, what have been some of the trends that you have seen over the past a um, few years where we have seen the digitalization of the world, the care shifting from traditional to the digital model. And where are those trends leading towards? So I'm going to change the markets. They're going to crash after, after I make my statement. <laughs> We're going to see the Russell Index dive after this. So, um, wow. Um, first of all, I want to I want to just uh, add on a little bit to what Mel said about what Aspen Rx is doing, just super. And um, and with Rx2, we're we're looking at that same aspects of the role of the pharmacist and what the pharmacist does in the community setting. We're saying, wait a minute, that can occur in clinical trials. And what we're finding is that we're building our platform of pharmacists, uh, independent community stores to start, is that they are already doing all the work. It's just under a different name, you know? So the, the value the pharmacist brings us, like all that information and the value that the pharmacist can bring through what Aspen is doing, we, we want to bring that down into clinical research. So now let's talk about your question about digitalization and the trends. Um, I could start by maybe saying, um, <clears throat> I started in the industry uh, when the 8086 processor computer, the desktop started in the industry. Right, we had we had just I just bought a leading edge computer when I got my first job, right? So there were no fax machines, not even fax machines, facsimile machines. If, if anyone knows what they are today, and when I think about the progression of technology through the years, 
I, I really came to uh, the realization that, wait a minute, even though we've watched all our productivity and everything drop into technology and all the technologies come from where we were doing it all by paper and manually to a desktop, right through the idea of the facsimile, uh, the, the, you know, before cell phones, iPads, you know, all that technology and the platforms, the Sun Microsystems, you know, the came the systems. What did it do for us? You know, and, and it did a lot operationally. But I keep coming back to when I started, nine out of 10 drugs failed to get through the regulatory approval process. Today, it's the same. Seven to 14 years, 40 years ago, it's still seven to 14 years. And so we look at costs and it's like, when I think about technology, we're at a critical point, and this is why I'm so excited for pharmacies, is I think for, for one of the first times using technology as a tool and how to, how to finally flip this model that we can use technology to gain success in what I call the strategic outcomes of the industry, right? And this is where I think we're all going. We're hitting on the individual operational aspects and, and improving efficiencies in the operational aspects with technology. But we've got to start thinking about how we can build that under a platform or together to say, how do we change the strategic outcomes of this? And I personally think, one of the reasons that hasn't happened before is because the pharmacist and clinical research hasn't been involved before. And who better to bring this together than the pharmacist? And that's where I think um, when I get really excited about the future of the practice of pharmacy, clinical research, uh, comes like what AspenRx is doing, uh, I think this is key. So the trends are we're gonna continue with the technology, we're gonna look at this COVID bubble, and I really think that we're gonna be a big piece about the success of finally changing the strategic outcomes using technology. I, I loved, Raul, that um, you mentioned around how, you know, yes, we see from the front of the care delivery side, when we have the medications in our hand, when we have the, um, the tools that could be used by patients, um, prescribed and delivered from pharmacies and hospital settings and ambulatory settings, but then tracing it back to where it started and how it built. And also going back to, <laughs> it reminded me of like EHRs 10 years before, like how clunky it was to read handwritings of doctors and interpret what medication it is or um, how much operationally we have progressed um, and accelerated. Um, in those moments, one thing that has also happened is using the technologies, patients have become more adapted to these technologies. Yes, of course, uh, COVID has accelerated that, but over time, patients have been starting to use, they want something that's convenient, that's timely, uh, that's accessible right where they are. And I think that goes back to Mel, you had mentioned around um, the virtual first care that Aspen RX is championing earlier. Um, I was curious around, if you can tell us more about uh, to our audience what virtual first care model is and what advantage does pharmacists have in the virtual care setting uh, when they're trying to take care of the patients, driving those outcomes, uh, delivering care where they are? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, you know, if you think about traditional pharmacy models, right, like they tend to rely on patients being the ones to initiate the pharmacist services. So usually it's through the fulfillment of needing to have a prescription filled. Um, but the pharmacist doesn't always have the full clinical picture to make appropriate interventions at that time when the patient comes to their counter. Or, you know, the patient may be rushed in a, in a retail, you know, a busy retail environment. And so through a virtual model, you know, one advantage really is that Aspen RX Health, like we allow pharmacists to not have to wait for patients um, to come to the pharmacy counter, but instead, you know, we're doing the outreach and identifying those opportunities <clears throat> to really engage patients when the time is right. So both logistically, but also clinically. So when it's convenient for them, but also when we know that um, there's something that's happened either in, you know, that we can see through claims data um, or some, you know, transition of care happening, a gap in care. And so then the pharmacist is prepared with really that full clinical picture. So you know, she can address multiple medication therapy problems or gaps in care in just one interaction um, with that patient. And, you know, our, our network of pharmacists share stories every day related to closing gaps that they 
would have never even known about or thought about or or had the opportunity to close. Um, so I think that's probably the the single biggest advantage, um, you know, to having that virtual first model is really that um, we kind of have that that more uh, you know control and, and flexibility of knowing when to target and engage really patients to really you know solve problems. Um, I I really like that. I think um, with the virtual model and as we are seeing that it's providing the care when patient needs it. I think hitting on the component of like not, especially in rural setting, for example, there are places where there are pharmacies across say 40 miles that someone has to drive to pick up their medication. Or if they have any questions, they will have to drive so far, which has, which was problematic and before, which uh, is an advantage and opportunity in the virtual setting side. So um, very excited that, you know, AspenRx is doing some incredible work there. Um, shifting gears there, something that I was, something that blew my mind recently, Gerald, I was reading about this article where CVS Pharmacy is actually turning the pharmacies into trial recruitment sites. And traditionally, if we have seen, you know, there's this data uh, that 80% of the clinical trials do not meet the patient requirement during the deadline and 10% of them uh, research side actually fails to even enroll one person. Um, Gerald, I'm curious to hear your thoughts around that. And also, um, how can we engage pharmacists early on in the research phase uh, when these therapies are being built, when these new medications and um, novel therapies are coming out to the market early on so that they are not only safe and effective, but also equitable and efficient um, care compendium um, on a full cycle? You, you want to put that into like two bullet points and three words each? <laughs> so, so, so first CVS, you brought that up and, and that was big news for everybody, but, but you saw it coming. And, um, and it's, I, I see that from our point of view as just a wonderful thing. Because one of the biggest hurdles we have, like we're trying to do is incorporate the practice of pharmacy, bringing practice pharmacy into clinical research was this obstacle like, wait a minute, that's new, that's different. And now you have CVS saying, you know, this billion dollar company saying, this is what we're going to do. We just knocked down a huge hurdle for the, for the practice of pharmacy, huge hurdle. Because now everybody's saying, oh yeah, yeah, pharmacists are involved in clinical research. It's like, well, let's talk about that for a minute. <laughs> you know, so, so one of the biggest obstacles we had to making our profession getting involved in clinical research just got knocked down for us. Now, understanding where CVS is, understanding their culture, um, you know, I understand where they're coming from, and, um, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that evolves, because they really are going to use their digital technology. It's really what I, if I understand it correctly, their, their platform and, and information where they come from. And I'm sure, Mel, you probably have some comments about this, too, about it isn't just about the data. And, and, I, and I state that because, like, when Mel was talking about this virtual ability to talk to patients, right, like I was just thinking about like in things that we've done and the rate limiting steps. And then I'll get to your second question in a, in a minute, but thinking about like CVS and, and what that means to us. So the proactiveness, right? The real time connectivity now that you have with patients is, is critical, right? And when I think about um, something that, again, all, all my career, I kept trying to bring the practice of pharmacy into clinical research and um, I did two forays. One was my on-demand packaging labeling. I created this on-demand concept now all patch and labeling companies are using, but all it was was bring dispensing into clinical research, you know, in, in the GMP world. The second thing we did was counseling patients in clinical trials. So we actually were paid to have pharmacists counsel patients in clinical trials. They'd go home from the clinic visit, we call them, right, the phones, right? <laughs> At that point, cell phones are, you know, we're using cell phones and not like today, but of the virtualness of which Mel and, and Aspen Rx has. But we were always limited by trying to make that engagement. You had to set up a call and how many calls do you make if you get the patient and stuff. And, and when I think about that um, special relationship that we had with patients and what we found was what was critical and new at the time was the real time nature of understanding problems. And I can give you an example of that. So there was a study and me being clinical supplies at the time, the package and labeling, we made labels and all the labels are the same. You gotta make sure you don't unblind. And, and so the label says, you know, take, take this medication at breakfast and dinner. 
wonderful. The study gets started, we get running after about eight to 10 patient calls, right? So now the study's starting to, because it's ramping up, it's diabetes. And um, our pharmacists are talking to the patient about the use of their medication and when they're taking it. And so one of the pharmacists asked, you know, so are you taking before breakfast, dinner? Yes. You know, the dose I just took and the pharmacist, like, the dose you just took, it's noon. Realizing now she's talking to somebody who's in the Midwest, right? So Midwest, right, like I'm, I, I'm a, I grew up on a farm, right? And this idea of dinner was always lunch, you know, it's supper is the evening meal, you know? I wasn't sophisticated, you know, knowing that dinner was, you know, when I got to college, like what, what's dinner when? And so after about 14 patients, we realized this was a study problem. And the question is, would it have been caught? Because the doctor, the nurse, the local, right, is all, it's all the same. And so then what happens is the drug fails, would have, you know, this was a pivotal phase three trial, right? You know, what impact does it have? So when I think about like what Mel's doing, what Aspenorx is doing in the real time input on drug therapy management, you know, that interaction they can have, this is where digitalization is taking us. Now it's a long winded answer kind of talk about the role of CVS coming into this and why pharmacists need to get involved. And when you talk about trends, I think I've just answered that as well, right? That's where you're going is what is the digital trend? It's moving to companies, taking us out of the, the, the this, right? To this, to more than, like when I think about the AI, so the, it, and we'll, we'll talk about this more, I'm sure. It's all about the data we collect and we can change the value proposition, right? Everybody's changing, like Google, what's their value proposition? <laughs> You know, how do they get paid? What do they get paid for, right? And so even just thinking about where's the value when we think about digital medicine, different than maybe a prescription drug. And, I, and, I, and this whole idea of digitization changes the, everybody's value proposition. I mean, look at the money's being raised. And you know, so I think in the trends, we're already there and everybody's already seeing it. And, and now you might be able to comment better to that, to that answer that question um, with what Smith raised. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. And, you know, it's funny because whenever, you know, we hear a story about um, a chain or, you know, one of these bigger companies doing something kind of in the space that we're innovating in, um, you know, it could be perceived as a threat. But honestly, I remember, you know, a similar um, experience. So I've spent a lot of my career really <clears throat> focused on medication adherence and the value and importance of, you know, pharmacists being able to drive improved adherence in an effort to, you know, which is everybody knows this now, right? But um, 10, 15 years ago, I remember in an airport seeing a, a big ad and it happened to be CBS about, you know, something about pharmacists can help you stay adherent on your medications. And I just thought, you know, I, I mentioned something um, to someone and they said, oh, isn't that kind of scary that they're playing in that space? And I said, no, it's awesome. Like, it's awesome that they're bringing this attention, right? I mean, we still have ways that we, you know, how we solve for that problem um, and, and innovators like, like the companies, you know, like RxE2 and Aspen, I think, you know, we may have different ways of sort of solving for that problem. But I think any time that we bring um, to the forefront the fact that pharmacists, whether it's with adherence or clinical services or clinical trials, you know, it's, it's good for our profession because I think it really sort of validates, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the need for pharmacists to be involved as, as Gerald, you just so eloquently sort of articulated in your story. You know, Mel, that, that gets me thinking further a little bit about these trends and where we're going, right? As everybody knows, one of the things is the, the terabytes of information being gathered, you know, it's all about the data. And, um, and as we move forward with um, these algorithms and layering them to get machine learning and where we eventually go to what I consider like true AI, um, you know, when I think about it, um, we have a long way to go. And I think one of the biggest things, and this is where like Dime comes in about the playbook that you have and um, you know, putting, establishing these standards instead of a thousand different ways of doing it, you have the standard ways to build. And a lot of that I look at is, is data quality outcomes. What does is, what is that data look like when it finally comes to analysis? And do you really need, and I, we wear these, right? Do we really need algorithms to correct the mistakes of the wrong data that's going in? And so when I look about the role of the pharmacists, and this is for all pharmacists who are attending today, you want to talk about the quintessential piece. I see the pharmacist as being the quintessential element to, to qualifying and making data quality data be. 
So for instance, when, when, if I'm a pharmacist and, and I, and I'm talking to a patient and we're talking about my, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever you're wearing, right. And that is collecting terabytes of information, right. But you as a patient and the pharmacist know that when you raise your hand, my heart rate just went up 20 beats. Now, I didn't do any, I just, it, I mean, it's just, it's part of it. So an algorithm will eventually correct that. But the pharmacist is going to know that immediately. They're going to learn that because they're going to talk to a thousand patients with this on. And what they learn from one with an interaction, like it, like something was crazy last night, at, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, my heart rate went to like 140. And I guarantee my heart rate never goes to 140 in the middle of the night, you know, um, unless, well, my wife's, we, no, no, we got there. Um, anyhow, <laughs> we, we, we um, so I think that it's the quintessential element that the pharmacist based upon the training of the pharmacist and are not just the educational and medication, but when I think about the operational expertise of the pharmacist and um, is going to be critical that this, we can start dividing and chunking this data and start saying, no, this, this is, you know, this is noise. Put that in the noise bucket. This is the data we want to be collecting. Um, and that, you know, based on what you just said, that it just reminded me of that I think that's key. Um, I think something that's very powerful that you touched upon, uh, Gerald and Mel, um, here is around the optimization of the data. You know, all these digital tools or remote patient monitoring devices, uh, sensor technologies that are coming out, the way it will be utilized, there would be a lot of data collection. There would be a lot of data generation. And I think um, I wanted to hear your thoughts around, because we could, as pharmacists are considered as medication experts who help optimize the therapies, um, how can they actually help with turning these data into one actionable data and then into actionable insights that drive outcomes? Are there strategies that pharmacists should be thinking about from now when they think about the digitalized world and the digital tools that are in the market outside that patient will be asking soon about? <laughs> Mel, do you want me to take first stab at that? Do you want me? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so when I think about that, um, moving aside to the payer model, because that's, I mean, that's in the commercial side that makes everything so much more difficult, you know, and because um, there have been thousands of articles published on the, you know, outcomes, you know, what the pharmacist plays and, and the benefits. But I think about like the role where the pharmacist can go with this is, um, and some of the digital medicine that's out there today, when I think about continuous glucose monitoring is probably to me one of the most accurate. So the data coming from that is very accurate, um, you know, and, and the role the pharmacist plays. And I know that a lot of the community-based stores are getting pretty good at like figuring out how to get collaborative practice agreements together and, and how to work with the doctors right, as a team to get paid, right? But most importantly, when I think about it, like how do you set it up, right? To, to actually give it best outcomes for the patient. Like, do they really want to go to the clinic each time, you know, or can they just come to your local pharmacy, which is really set up and get more convenient, you know, based upon because that's what the pharmacist does. So I think operationally, so this, the, 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 the invest or the, the physician absolutely sets it up, gets the device going, but then it's just like the medication, the refills, the pharmacist takes care of it. Then they go back to the doctor and say, how did it all go? And I think the same thing in digital medicine and where we're going, it's going to be, you, you set something up, but who takes care of the operational, right? The month, the month, the month. Even some of the, like some of the unbelievable virtual, virtual monitoring, uh, virtual um, um, mask and stuff they have for pain, you know, starting to talk about real digital medicine. I mean, you're talking, how do you, how do you, you're impacting pain through technology, right? And so the same thing you set up, how much are those, those, how much do they cost? Where is that done? If the patient wants pain relief, where do they go? You know, can they set up in their home? And then it comes back down to what I call the operational impact of a pharmacist. Right? Most patients need that little push on how to use it, the incorrect usage of it. You know, they're going to home and use it and come back and you're going to find out, no, you, you know, uh, Smith, uh, you know, let's, let's look at this for a minute. And, and then it's a, it's a learning. So most of the time when pharmacists talk to patients about their medication and counseling, it isn't a, it's a, it's, it's a teaching learning environment. It's not a telling and this is what, you know, so it's, it's the patient and the pharmacist building that relationship to say just, how it's going to work together in that person's entire health 
in that person's entire setting. And so I think about digitalization, where we're going with these, um, again, this virtual monitors, um, you know, with uh, CGM, with, you know, I, I see the pharmacy playing a critical role in the operational aspects of this um, and making sure, of course, the, 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 the how to use it properly. Like, for instance, these don't wear close to your, your wrist because it revibrates off and that's what gives you the wrong data. It's little things like that that the farm I know, and every patient I see, I'm going to say, "Listen, where are you wearing your 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 Fitbit or your?" Oh, sorry, I don't want to use any names. So you know, or the, the anyhow. So long-winded answer, Mel. I'm, I apologize for that, but I um, feel very strong about that. Yeah. No, I think you know, pharmacists to me, um, we by nature we are trained right around data, evidence-based. Yeah. Most of us um, really kind of enjoy, um, you know, like we're we're really kind of experts around looking at data. And but I also think we're sort of that intersection to your point of operationalizing and like the intersection between the data, the information, and then how to interpret it and make it make sense for a patient, right? And in the clinical kind of picture. And I think that's one of the things that pharmacists do really well. You know, a lot of times we are sort of the the front door, if you will, um, of healthcare. They say sometimes, I think, um, we are always considered one of the top professions in terms of trust. Um, and we're very accessible, like you don't need an appointment necessarily to go talk to your pharmacist. Um, but I think why pharmacists are so trusted is because we have that unique ability. Um, the credibility is because of our knowledge base and of our ability to take data and interpret it. And so I think pharmacists, you know, we, we probably, you know, geek out more than anybody about some of the advances and, and all of the data. But I also think we have that unique ability to sort of help translate it for patients and, and in terms of the clinical picture. And what's really important out of, you know, um, all the you know, the different data sources that we have. Um, and so I think it's a real unique opportunity for pharmacists and something that, you know, I, cer I certainly know many, many pharmacists are very excited about um, to see so much more data at our fingertips. And so how we continue to, you know, um, utilize that and make that available for pharmacists is really important. And so like at Aspen, you know, we've kind of built this technology that really enables the pharmacist to, have everything at their fingertips and all the information they need, but yet really focus on the patient care, which is probably what they like to do the most, right? And not be actually trying to also solve, you know, the, the problem of, of filling in the data gap. Yeah, I think it, it's very important in terms of, you know, how we actually use the data and then use that to improve the patient care. And in, in terms of are they improving their health? Are they improving the experience, the, the care setting? And something that has been challenging and I have been noodling around is, you know, right now there are three challenges we have seen from regulatory of provider status to some of the business industry challenges of uh, fee-for-service model, though it, there has been trends towards value-based and that is our North Star. Um, what is the role of pharmacists look like in this movement and what good good looks like for a pharmacist in this time yeah if, if you don't mind Gerald I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at that one <laughs> um, so you know beyond what attracts pharmacists to a model where they're empowered to sort of build that clinical practice um, the other side of the equation is really health plans and PBMs and you know the value that again as I mentioned earlier that um, I think pharmacists can bring to the healthcare system is really through our ability to improve outcomes and drive down costs um, through those clinical services. So these types of models where we're able to, you know, not focus on dispensing and, you know, the commoditization really of pharmacy, but more so on the value-based components. And so anything that we do, whether it's, you know, what, what, um, Gerald and the team are doing at RFC2, whether what we're doing at Aspen, that's really more focused on, um, on the, the clinical aspects and the value we can bring ultimately contributes, right, to um, 
achieving that goal, that North Star of of really demonstrating um, how pharmacists play a role and and set the tone for why it makes sense to continue advancing as providers. And so I think we've seen, you know, some momentum in that direction. There's certainly, you know, a ton of work to do, but I think the more that we're able to sort of demonstrate the impact that we have um, and ha having like, you know, uh, whether it's drug companies or or health plans um, really achieve that quadruple aim. I just think pharmacists are really uniquely positioned um, to, to uh, contribute to those goals. Yeah, very well said, Mel. It made me, as you were talking, it's like a, just a plethora of, it you know, fills my mind about like, I'm a big one that always looks at time. <clears throat> you know, something today, what we think, you know, it's like, it's like something, most of the time it's negative, something bad happens and, and we look at it for what it is today. But five years later, we look back and say, you know, that was a pretty good thing that happened, you know? And all I could think about is um, I was dispensing in the pharmacies and, and when the Omnibus, Omnibus Reduction Budget Act, uh, uh, Ober, well, Ober was part of it, was passed. Budget Reduction Act was passed. <clears throat> and that required pharmacists to counsel patients in the Medicaid, Medicare space, which then he said, if you counsel one, how can you not counsel every, everybody? And I remember at the time, the, the APHA and everybody was talking about, well, wait a minute, you know, what about payment? You know, we're gonna be counseling. But at the time, when you think about it, the price of counseling was included in the dispensing fee of the drug before um, where we know the payment models and now pharmacists actually lose money dispensing drug, you know, let alone counsel, because that's really where the value is. It was an intangible at the time, even though the value back then was enormous, it was just part of the dispensing fee, right, that you would get. And all I could think about at the time, I remember the dean of the College of Pharmacists listened to, uh, and went to a presentation and he had, he said, listen, we, we've made, consciously made the choice that we're going to do this and embrace it and we'll work to get paid. So now we are 30 years later and we're still not getting paid for it. But here we are today and I think about that, what then happened? The pharmacist then became the only servant leader, true servant leader in the healthcare profession. Because as you stated several times, where else can you go and get free advice, 24, free healthcare advice 24 seven? Even during COVID, who was open? Pharmacies, right? You can walk into any pharmacy and I was talking to a pharmacist the other day and he's like, yeah, we're counseling on, you know, all kinds of things. Like as, as ever, I remember talking to someone about hires, you know, because <laughs> but anyhow, you know, counseling comes in many forms. So when I think about it, it created this, um, I think the trust factor, you know, is why it was always there because you can always walk into your pharmacy. Now, whether certain stores or others pharmacists available, you know, but, but I don't care which store you go into, the pharmacists will come out no matter how busy they are, because I think it's, again, we, you know, we take an oath. But then as we move further, and I think about where we are, <clears throat> as we look back, may, may, we, may we not make the same mistakes moving forward. So as we talk about digital medicine, and I think we have this golden opportunity right now as we're on the cusp of being involved, to once again, stay true to our profession, but this time make sure that we get paid because with the digital medicine, like you're saying, all the information, how, to, how we capture the information and push that on, there's a different payer. Right? There's a different uh, paradigm out there for the value, you know, the payment of this, right? Because companies now data is you're getting paid for your data, not for this, right? And so I think that we're, it's, it's no, um, it's just going to take a little bit more time, but I think the practice of pharmacy is well positioned to take advantage more than any of the other perfect, and I'm, I'm, I'm being, you know, um, um, you know, proud to be a pharmacist, you know, it's like, of course, everybody's going to be participating. But I think we're, we're best positioned to take advantage of this and drive this forward. Because when I think about uh, the payers, like those digital medicines, you know, to go out and, and get reimbursed for this, who's better to team up with to figure this out than the, the pharmacist operation is going to be using this all the time. And so it's a theoretical answer to you, because there is no, if, if we had the answer, we'd be there already. You know, but I think that we're poised to make the best decisions about all this. And I think poised to really push digital medicine forward. You know, that isn't just part of the COVID bubble that's going to end soon, you know, and then everybody's worrying about like, do we go backwards? Do we go back? You know, which everybody says we're not. I mean, which I agree, but sorry. Yeah, very well said, Gerald. And I think um, I really like the concept of like 
things in the digital medicine world moving forward, what are some of the mistakes that we have learned from in the past or becomes an opportunity for future in terms of now when we look forward to what is the value proposition of the virtual uh, first care that uh, Mel and team at SNRX are involved with impact initiative at DIME. Um, so it will be critically important looking towards those not stars and how we utilize pharmacists in the process and move towards that goal of value-based models um, and value-based care moving forward. Um, that, so yeah, please. Which is where I think is um like the, which is why like one of the key things for actually too why we want to be involved in clinical trials. We want pharmacists involved in clinical trials because we're going to have value to the medication before it goes out, digital or otherwise. That's going to be part of how this is going to work. So we're going to get drugs approved based upon pharmacists counseling patients in the clinical trial. That guess what? You can't just like not. So if you look at specialty farming, pharma pharmacy, pharmacy to our specialty products, that's that's all practice of pharmacy. That drug isn't into, in, into the general public. There's special pharmacies, specialty pharmacies that are dispensing that medication, counseling that medication, following up, and of course making sure that the payments are going to be there. But that's a perfect example of where it's, that's a practice of pharmacy is going that all medicine should follow. Tele, tele, you know, or digital, tele. Um, um, Small molecule, large molecule should all follow. You know. Mm -hmm. um, Mel, any last minute thought before we open up for audience for questions? Yeah, um, you know, I think we've said this a couple times, but I just to really drive home again that pharmacists are such a valuable asset um, in the care delivery system, and so you know we we've got to make sure that we're part of that shift right and and as that landscape shifts to virtual models and i think you know to gerald's point we are poised but more so than that we're already you know um leading i think in in some areas and so you know i think pharmacists are one of the groups um and pharmacies even and and you know the whole industry you know that really was able to be very responsive um in the pandemic uh and so i just think too you know we were already sort of poised and so now it's just a matter of continuing to you know push forward and, and demonstrate our value um so that we can continue that momentum that we've experienced thus far in, in that shift with digital medicine Absolutely. Um, and also the fact that we will continue to have the 24 hour model of uh, free advice if anyone wants on any of the digital medicine products. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry, Mel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll open up for audience if anyone has any questions. Hi, everyone. I'll, I'm going to butt in. Um, I, my name is Rachel Chassie. I'm Director of Innovation here at DIME, and I have been lurking on this webinar. Um, so part of my lurking means that I get to ask a question first for, for um, Q&A. Now, I also, of course, would like to say again that everyone on the line is welcome to ask questions, and a lot of the value of these live events is the ability to interact um, directly with our fantastic panelists. So Mel and Gerald, thank you so much. I am learning so much um, about the current role and the future of pharmacists for digital medicine, and you're certainly getting me jazz. Um, hearing the great commentary from you both is getting um, the hamster in my head running on its wheel. Um, so I'm also struck by Mel, you mentioning that historically and continually, pharmacists are um, seen as some of the most trustworthy um, professions. Right now, I'm thinking about this in the aspect of digital medicine and also talking about how ubiquitously accessible pharmacists are also thinking um, some more of what Gerald has been mentioning. So, so my question comes back to trust in the digital medicine space, right? With all these new tools, it looks like one of the, the biggest hurdles that we're having to address as an industry is trust in technology. So my question um, for both of you, um, especially going about how well-trained pharmacists are you know, having taken an oath, having to understand um, sort of data and technology. My question is, how do you see pharmacists playing a, a very uh, a useful role here in trying to um, kind of raise the, kind of raise trust when it comes to digital medicine products, both in um, sort of clinical research and also just in cl clinical care? And I do wanna uh, start that question off um, to Mel, since you um, have mentioned how, um, how we all love pharmacists and they're super well trusted in the community. Yeah, well, I think, you know, one thing we can do is, is pharmacists 
tend to have some of those relationships already um, with patients. And so we can kind of, um, you know, build upon that, right? And so anytime that there's, you know, I, I think about anytime something new comes up, um, we can sort of help uh, provide that education. You know, we're seeing right now with vaccines, you know, the first step was getting shots in the arms, right? And now it's more about educating, you know, some of the population around um, the value of it. And I think pharmacists can, you know, are perfectly aligned um, to be not only the ones to give the shots, but to be to, because they've got that relationship. In terms of, you know, digital medicine, I think the other big piece, um, which this this allows, um, you know, pharmacists to sort of create that more longitudinal relationship with, with patients. And so as we do that, again, that's another way that we can kind of continue to build that trust. So even if it's not an established relationship, um, having, you know, historical data and then being able you know, to share with the patient over time, we can build that trust, right? And so it may be something that you kind of have to work um, towards, but I think the fact that, you know, it sets us up well for being able to have those more longitudinal relationships, um, to have that data kind of at our, at our fingertips. Yeah, if I could just maybe give a quick response to that too, and, and think about it a little bit, little bit different than that is when I think about those companies developing digital medicine, <clears throat> face the challenge of what you say about technology is we've talked about the relationship pharmacist patient have. There is this trust. And um, and like most of the community pharmacists that we're working with and stuff, they are very protective of their patients. And so what I want to say is, is like, if, if, you, if you want to have a successful digital medicine product, you've got to get the pharmacist on board because patients won't trust necessarily. Where is this, where is this information going? And most importantly, like the difference between like this is fun to know my you know, sleep and others, you know, that, but is it making my healthcare decisions as something else? And so I think that Mel's point is that it's that conversation. Pharmacists are excellent at communication at the levels, social economic conditions, you know, et cetera, or even the, like you talked about New York City and different, um, you know, diverse populations and the local pharmacists and that discussion. So when I think about it, First and foremost, it's it's making sure that pharmacist is knowledgeable and knows what's happening to that and knows how this is going to be used and why it's going to be used so that they could be your voice. Um, so I see that as a critical piece of, for those companies developing. I, I see more of the pharmacists being the front line uh, for like even down the well, I don't say regulatory pathway, but down the pathway of success um, moving forward just because of that relationship. I certainly agree. And I really enjoy both of you guys' response. Um, I'm also thinking about how we work really hard to um, earn trust, but I think it's also on the responsibility of the developers to make something in the first place that is worthy of trust, right? We've done a great disservice if we work really hard to have folks trust this product. If this product is not worthy of trust, we really screw over patients when we do that in the entire field. So, I, you know, I think that, you know, having more pharmacists involved in clinical research creates a, a, a feedback mechanism. So whenever we're thinking about using these, these tools and having your, the experience directly with um, patients and people, right? I'm also thinking about how these are the kinds of feed, this is the feedback that we're getting. This is my initial feedback before we even put it in patients based on the fact that I've dealt with patients every day, every day, coming into my door, knocking on my door, asking me for anything advice from, pills to tires, right, Gerald? So I think having them more involved is another pathway to help kind of um, kind of facilitate some um, sort of patient insights if we can get pharmacists more involved in clinical research. So thank you both. I, I do have, yeah, go ahead, Smith. Rachel, after you, please finish. Oh, sure. So of course, I've got another question um, here. And also, um, after my quick question, I see that Parisa, if you're in a place to unmute yourself, um, you've got a great comment here that we'd love to give you some airtime for. So my question too kind of goes back to the just sort of how um, yeah, accessible pharmacists are, perhaps one of the most accessible healthcare professionals in the United States, at least. So that creates a really great opportunity to um, access these diverse populations that we've had a, a really difficult time getting involved in things like clinical research. Um, you both have mentioned kind of the different kinds of ways and experience that, that uh, you guys have, you guys bring. I particularly really enjoy the comments about uh, dinner, lunchtime 
uh, Gerald, that you mentioned that affects kind of other, you know, farming populations. And then, of course, Mel, you mentioned the different kinds of um, professionals that you have. But if we can bring, you know, pharmacists more into the conversation against the clinical research and getting them more involved in the different kinds of clinics that they're already in and, and pharmacies they're already in, could this really help bring um, raise diversity and also access to clinical trials to, to folks who haven't had access before? You've answered that yourself, of course. Of course. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I give you? Did I ask you a question to get you to say what I want? No, no. I'm just saying, like, you, like, <laughs> like you, you, like, you may ask the question, but it's like I think we're all saying, of course it will. I mean, because we know that the community pharmacist, within, everybody's within three miles, three to five miles of community pharmacy. And like, I want to point out too is that it was interesting because I was listening to, um, you know, a presentation and they had patient advocates you know, on it. And, the, and it was great to hear the patients, the patients' voice that we hear. And um, sorry for the background noise here. And it was um, very interesting because the patient was talking about access, right? And she was talking about like, there's a dollar store in every town. And it was interesting because like, I wonder, I, I couldn't reach out like this and say, listen, you know, Edith, there's also a pharmacy in every town. The only issue is we don't have those pharmacies involved in clinical research yet. And, but we're, we're changing that. That's going to change overnight really, and especially like a CVS and stuff, it's going to change overnight. So, so my answer is emphatic yes to your question. <laughs> I love that. I love that pharmacists are starting from the uh, research front, and it's, it's never been a better time than involving them from the ground level of where the research starts. And we have a fantastic comment from uh, Risa. And Risa, I would go ahead and unmute yourself. And if you want to share your thoughts, we would love to hear that. Oh, uh, thank you, Smith. And thank you, Fabulous Digital Medicine Society. What an amazing, uh, engaging uh, discussion. Thank you, Gerald and Mel. Love your insights and perspectives. I'm sitting here like on the edge of my seat as I hear you smiling and nodding vigorously. Completely agree with that. Uh, all the things you are leading. Um, but yes, it's a completely exciting time, right, for pharmacists because um, as you both have pointed out, right, we are the medication experts, we're in the front lines, we, um, we, we've just really, in, the, in our neighborhood pharmacies, we've, uh, in some ways, we've been data rich, and in many ways, we've been data poor, right? And in the ways that there have been gaps, in the ways that we have been data poor, uh, guess what? Digital medicine closes that gap. And so, you know, to leave pharmacists out of the picture here would be, uh, oh, you know, we'd be remiss in doing so, right? Because we're the ones, as you guys are so beautifully articulating, that can uh, match patient with medicine plus digital companion, right? With the proper consent, uh, sensor, connect the connect sensor product, right? Uh, both in terms of uh, monitoring for adherence, but also uh, having the biomarkers, the data to see whether the medicines are working properly, right? So it really can help us to have a more targeted way in our conversations with our patients and our conversations back to the uh, prescribers, right? To be that conduit, uh, but really, I think I always kind of say it like this, pharmacist as curator, translator, coach, right? Match patient with digital for the product, help with the operational elements, as you said, Gerald, right? So to help to um, ensure that they get patients set up with the product, right? And they're going to use it properly, but we'd be remiss if we only saw pharmacists as identifying patients to match with and, and then having them set it up. But if we weren't part of then getting the data, right? So we need to be definitely part of that piece for the remote monitoring, that optimization elements. Um, and uh, I do wanna see this part of our service in order to scale this, it needs to be part of a value-based model, right? We need to be compensated for this. Um, so uh, very exciting. So my comment was, guess what? In order to make this happen, we need to start in pharmacy school. Right, so super excited that um, the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy will be having a digital he uh, health institute uh, this year in October. So all pharmacy school faculty, there'll be like four to five pharmacy faculty from all pharmacy schools attending this to learn about digital health. So they can also learn how to thread it into the curriculum. So we'll then start to graduate the next generation of pharmacists with this knowledge, with this, and so they'll look for this in practice. And of course, the American Pharmacists Association and California Pharmacists Association has been trying to close the gap in terms of continuing education for the practicing pharmacists. Um, so lots of exciting things and so excited to be partnering with 
Digital Medicine Society, like Smith said, with the Digital Clinical Measures Playbook and um, all those kinds of things. So I'm going to stop because I'm I could go on and on, but I think there's a lot of excitement here, and pharmacists can really lead this digital health transformation. One minute follow up. Great, Paris, about the digital gap. Data rich, data poor. Couldn't agree more. I also want to point out too that the, not only in the uh, schools are, is that changing, right? The curriculum, just like medical school, et cetera, they're bringing it in. But also in the last 10 years, 50% of the states now have laws about clinical research, about the dispensing of clinical drug and about the labeling of those clinical supplies and, and about the counseling of patients. And so states are now incorporating research laws, right? They're incorporating now clinical research into the laws, state pharmacy laws. Um, now, granted, it's been driven by CBD, I believe, but it's those laws are not just anyhow. So it, it's changing, just as you said, Teresa, and that's great. It starts in the schools. Yeah, for sure. The, the digital clinical trials, uh, you know, getting pharmacists involved in that is truly exciting, right? Because, you know, we talk about kind of disparities and who gets enrolled in these and, you know, you can really break down some barriers for that. You know, folks who might not have been part of a study because they couldn't, they had transportation barriers, things like that, you know, what 90% of the population lives within five miles of a pharmacy, right? So that whole thing. So really exciting what we can do there. And I think with all the, you know, with digital pharmacies really exploding, right? And people being accustomed to having medicines delivered to their home, right? And, you know, uh, none of us went to pharmacy school to count by five. So we can see that kind of rapidly changing, right? And that being kind of AI robotics, digital, you know, that being just, you know, shipped to the home. So the, what are we, it's kind of like, we don't close these community pharmacies, we reinvent what it means to visit your neighborhood pharmacy. And so it's exciting to think about, yes, the clinical services, but also the clinical trial element um, and um, remote monitoring, all of that. Very exciting. I love that. Um, thank you so much, Risa, for sharing this amazing insights. And I also want to thank, um, we'll make sure that we are on time, Mel, Gerald. This was terrific conversation. I think this, we are so excited to, I personally learned a lot about Aspen RX Health and um, RX E2 from the amazing conversations we had, but I wanted to thank uh, for your time, energy, and uh, being such a great panelist today. Also, before we end, just a quick close out, wanted to share with the colleagues on the call, our next virtual journal club is actually um, on contextualizing progress in the AI or artificial intelligence revolution by David, who's the founder of Astounding Health Tech and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. So please join on June 12th, 11 a.m. Eastern, and to continue our drive for the webinars and sharing these expertise and bringing the amazing panels. Uh, the next one is on July 13th on patient insights from clinical research to product development, where our partners, um, Jen from Savvy Cooperative and Megan from Mahana, would be joining us, sharing around how can we use patient insights early on in the product development. But I wanted to say again, thank you so much for amazing, amazing conversations, Mel and Jarrell, uh, for being with us today. And hope everyone on the call has a blissful day and stay amazing, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, all. <laughs>